that our communities are gonna get more violence by 200 police officers, 45 more cameras, and spot shotting technology, right? So those type of investments, and like Tavis, which if you work with young people in communities like these, Tavis was a horrible 10 years, right? What an experience. Where these police officers, and it's happened to me, I'm sure probably many people in the room, where they just randomly stop you, question you. Um, that tells you something about whether your city loves you, right? Or your country, and what you're, you might be pushed to do because of the everyday experience of, of, of violence. So that's the things I think about and, and how currently now, the current context, after all of these decades of things that we've been, I guess, pushed to, uh, to endure or to live through, um, now it's a different attack, right? So that we see how Queens Park and Ford is uh, at a moment where city council has a potential of looking different, right? There's a lot of new, there's three new wards, there's a lot of candidates, young, people like us that have gone through the experience um, who, who decided to throw their hat in the ring. Um, and at that exact moment, we have a premier who says, in the election period, yeah, we're just gonna go with 25. Um, and then all of the councilors that have supported that motion are white and they're political dynasties. And they trend conservative. So, so what little control we have of how our communities look at City, at city Hall is very much under attack. And I think meetings like this to discuss how we do what we've always been doing, taking care of each other, um, is becomes all the more all the more important. Um, so so I think that's that's important. So I'll just continue for a little bit. Um, go ahead. So I've been I've been thinking about um, how we really have unconditional love uh, for this place for Toronto, but they have a cheap recognition for us, and sometimes that's enough to hold us in its spelling bind. I'm guilty too of mistaking this cheap rec recognition for the real thing. Because when my deep love for Toronto gets tested and stretched real, real thin as it very often does, I tell myself, Toronto's beautiful, even when it's not. And lately that saying is not offering the same like solace or pleasure it used to. Lately it's been ringing hollow and empty. And I've been thinking about how we ride so hard for this place when it stays trying to keep beating us down, all of us down to dust. I usually, uh, work to reach for more tact, grace, and refinement. But I think the collective response from this moment, from our mayor, chief of police, premier, and prime minister, um, I'm just filled with rage. So I'm thinking to myself that my love for Toronto is dead. In response to highly publicized recent events in our city, Mayor Tory and chief of police Mark Saunders held a joint press conference on, on July 12th. And they announced that they were calling their gun violence reduction plan Broadly speaking, Chief Mark, uh, Mark Saunders said the Toronto Police Force's plan included, among other things, adding more frontline resources during certain days between the hours of 7 p.m. and 3 a.m. when most of the gun violence takes place across the city. More police officers in black communities will just inflict more violence on black and racialized communities. And TBS, they've always said, Toronto Police, uh, that their best intelligence gathering tool has always been, I think too much, too much that we mentioned it, Carter. They've always said that their best intelligence tool is Cardi. We know in places like here, Cardi never stopped. So now we get, like, our, we die, and I, I wrote that police literally get overtime. And, uh, and the number one line item in this city's budget is policing. So this happened in 2005. We had one of our members of our community die in a public school. A whole roots of violence report with all of these recommendations about a holistic, um, you know, plan about neglect, about access to groceries, about public transportation, about race, racism in schools, about a whole, I have, I have it written down, but I know you guys know, I know you know. We know how this place looks, it's not supposed to look like this. And they're, when they're talking about bu building a billion dollar park downtown, but we're tearing down houses in our community. So to me, that is legitimate violence. So I think, I think when we think about that, and we think about that we're on not even, uh, half attack or you know, PR, play with words, Duff Ford is coming for us and our communities in no uncertain terms. So the ways that we've always done, and I've always said that Jayden Finch always teaches me how to take care of each other and my people and community, um, that's gonna be even more. Here. So meetings like this, um, when we think about what these police are gonna do, 7 p.m. to 3 a.m., these kids already don't play outside. They're not gonna go, what, the police are not gonna want them to go outside. So they're basically giving us a curfew for our kids. So I'm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, 
of different ways of how we take care of each other. And I, I do have one positive thought. I remember, I remember. On August 14th, 15 years ago, does anybody know what happened in the city? You guys remember? Yeah, the black box. I only remember because August 14th is my birthday. <laughs> but I had an exam at York, and it didn't happen. We didn't know what was going on. We walked. I walked home, and it was completely dark. But then I walked along Jane Street. Anybody remember what was happening on Jane Street 15 years ago? It was a party. Bonfires. People were taking weed out there for sure. Yo, it's gonna go bad anyway. I was like. I was, I was walking down the street and people were throwing, I'm sorry, I don't eat bacon, but I'll go over here. <laughs> it was a legit part. And I, every time I've, I've said, when the revolution comes and everything is burned down, I'll be a jail fit. Because we know how to take care of each other when we don't know what the hell is going on. Everything, everything. everything. And this is before like, we could put it on blast on social media. It wasn't like lit live yet. But I was walking down J Street and I was legitimately surprised. And I always think, there's something about the ways these structures have always been violent. But there's ways in which people, we've been, always been like huddled in and close because the way they build communities, but then we also make concern and care for each other. Um, so I hold on to that as it doesn't look like <laughs> in a bleak, bleak time, in a bleak condition. So I'm thinking about that, um, but I could definitely leave it right there and take some questions. But I definitely want to appreciate the organizers even inviting me and having me. Sorry I was late. I was uh, running around. Thank you so much. Um, 
address or to fight combat gun violence. But I'm sad to say that 7.1 7 million of this is for enforcement and surveillance. Only about a million of that will go to community initiatives. Then the, our new provincial government announced a major investment of 1.9 billion, billion, not million, for mental health and addictions. The federal government will add to that, making it a total of 3.8 million billion, with most of it to deal with how police and other responders deal with people experiencing mental health. So now, what about the needs of the mental health for mental health services? We've got about 12,000 children and youth in Ontario waiting for services. The wait time is over a year for most of these. And if we don't address these issues, we know that later on they will lead to other issues that are probably physical. Again, we see this every day with people coming into our center with diabetes, high blood pressure, and a lot of it was caused by stress. Stress that was worsened by things like living in inadequate housing conditions, um, not even having access to housing, inadequate jobs, having to work um, many, many jobs to make a living, and not having enough time even for the children who may be experiencing mental health and addictions. Now, hearing that, remember that most of the investments that the government is making to mental health is not into community programs and prevention programs, it's to policing, surveillance, and enforcement. That's the other one. Okay. So next, I just want to talk, I'm going to just go through a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to talk about our, the police response to people who are dealing with mental distress. Not mental health, mental distress. Um, while there, we know that we have a large number of gun deaths resulting in deaths, uh, in, gun violence resulting in deaths, we know that a recent statistic was that 73% of those um, had a mental health or addictions condition, condition. Some of them were actually killed by police violence, police gun violence. Um, and I want to I wanna read the names of some of them that you might have heard of. Um, so since 1988, at least 12 families have lost loved ones in mental health distress killed, mental distress killed by Toronto police officers. Um, in memory of those individuals and out of respect for their families, it's important that we don't forget their names or when we lost them. Most recently, Andrew Luku um, in 2015, Sammy Yatim, Michael Ellington, uh, Rial Jardine Douglas, Byron DeBassi, um, O'Brien Christopher Reed, Otto Bass, Tony Andrade, Edmund Yu, Wade Williams, and in 1988, Lester Donaldson. Now, most of these individuals were male. Most, a lot of them were people of color mostly black males. Um, and I wanted to talk about um, Rial, Rial Jar Jardine Douglas. Um, he was born on April 7th, 1985, and he was shot and killed by the police on eight, August 29th, 2010. Now Rial was my nephew, and Rial was, Rial was um, dealing with some mental health distress, and his sister, called the police, and his mom called the police to help them get him to a hospital. Rial was um, a quiet young man who was very bright, and I remember when Rial started expressing some mental health issues. It was after he was in school, 
And one of his teachers asked him why he had braids in his hair. And he was he a girl? <laughs> um, after that time, Riel 